Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we are reviewing Factfulness by Ola, Anna, and Hans Rosling. 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. This is cool. Uh, the 10, 10 reasons are these 10 cognitive biases that we all suffer from, but illustrated through the world and what's going on in terms of health, uh, poverty, economic development, all these things around the world that maybe we think it's really, really bad, but it's actually nowhere near as bad as we think. So, we tend to have a really dramatic and overdramatic worldview when we look at some of the things. If you, if you look at like war, violence, natural disasters, man-made disasters, you think that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, the number of poor just keeps on increasing. Soon, we're going to run out of resources if we don't do something drastic and we're fucking up the environment, all this stuff. You might just think that Things are getting bad and they feel like they're getting worse, right? It certainly does feel like they're, they're getting worse and the, I guess the sensationalism around all of these negative things makes it feel like we're definitely on a, tra- a downward trajectory that things are not as good as they used to be and they're getting worse. But what the, uh, the, the Rosling Trio highlights here is that we're actually on a very, very good trajectory and things are getting better every single year. There are some things that he points out that we should be concerned about, but most of the things we're concerned about is just way way overdramatic and really not accurate. So, we're actually much better adopting what he says is a factfulness kind of view to the world. And he does talk about those mental models of where we get overdramatic and get an an inaccurate understanding of what's actually going down. The first chapter he talks about is called the gap instinct. And one thing that he tells this through the lens of child mortality and child mortality really gives you a good sense or he says it really takes the temperature of the whole society because it's a it's one single statistic that can really tell you a lot about the health of and the prosperity of people in that country children are super fragile if you think about it they can die from things like germs starvation violence so Parents and society need to protect the children in any way they can from all the dangers of the things that could kill them. So, how successful they are at protecting children from all, all the society, all the dangers that are really out there, is a good way of really understanding at what level the society is sitting at. Yeah. So he's got a few specific country examples here. So Saudi Arabia in 1960, the death rate or the child mortality rate was 242 kids per thousand were That's dying. Huge. That's enormous, man. Uh, in the in the 50 years after that, it's dropped down to 35 and dropping fast. So, 35 per thousand from 242. That's a big drop. Big improvement in overall standard of living there. And Malaysia, it was 93 in 1960 and it's down to 14 today. And so, saying that, you know, 14 out of a thousand die, it means that 986 out of a thousand survive. So, we're definitely just by those two statistics, on a very incredible trajectory in the right direction. There's no country in the world where child mortality is actually increasing. Mm. So, the whole general trajectory on this really important statistic at every country is going rapidly in the right direction. He sets us up with a a scatter plot, a graph in the book, and the graph is against uh, the number of babies per woman versus the percentage of children that survive past five years old. And there's two very clear cu- clusters. There's the countries that have high number of babies per women and a high percentage of children that are dying young. And then there's the countries that have a low number of uh, babies per woman and a high survival rate, so a low death rate. And there's two very clear clusters. But then what he shows us in the book, that was actually a graph from 1965. He fast forwards then to show us the 2017 graph and keeping those same boxes... Almost everybody was in the graph of lower number of babies per women and higher survival rate. So, he showed that there was only actually 13 countries that were still stuck in that box of a lot of babies and a lot of children dying young. So, that was for one extremely important metric. But interestingly, he's also, after that, plots the correlation for a whole bunch of different others. So, things like income level, tourism, democracy, access to education, healthcare, and electricity, they've all got the same story, whereas 1965, they were in the stereotypical, what we'd consider the developing world. Everyone's moved up into this incredible level of standard of living all all over the world, and there might just be a, a small handful of countries that are you know, considered developing and really struggling in these areas. Yeah, so that's what this he calls this mega misconception that the world is divided into two. We might have called it, you know, first world versus third world or developed versus developing or maybe we really just mean, you know, rich versus poor, west versus the rest or really just 
us versus them. That's the misconception, yeah. That's a big misconception, man, that we think that we're you know, in this rich country and everybody else is in this poor country and there's a big gap between us and everybody else. But what he's really showing that through these graphs, that yeah, perhaps 50, 100, 200 years ago, there was a big gap, but now almost everybody is moving towards the middle. There's no longer a big distinction between the developed countries and the developing countries. So it really isn't just us versus them broken down into just two categories. You should really be breaking it down into what he says is four different categories because the, the, the distinctions between these other categories are absolutely huge and they're really important to understand. So on level one is one billion people in the world and they're earning less than $2 a day. So this is your stereotypical, you know, poor people. Extreme poverty. Extreme poverty, right? And he explains visually which I think is really important, actually what their standard of living is and what they have to deal with. So if you live like one of these people, for example, one day you know your youngest daughter might get a nasty cough from the smoke of the indoor fire which weakens her lungs and she might get an infection because you're on only two bucks a day or less, you can't afford antibiotics. So a few months later, your, your daughter's dead. And to get water, your five children spend hours walking barefoot with a single plastic bucket for water on their heads and they're fetching water from a really dirty mud hole. So this is the the standard of living of these people uh, really struggling. And if you're lucky, you know, you struggle on, you fight through, your kids can start playing on the fields as well. Maybe you develop your crops to a point where you can sell some of your surplus production. And if you move to be earning more than $2 a day, he says, congrats, you're up to level two. Now, level two is between $2 to $8 a day. And that's 3 billion people in the world. And there's a big distinction between level one and level two. So he says, well, what do you do with all this extra money, you know, the extra couple of bucks a day that you've got from selling your crop? So perhaps, you know, you maybe can go to the market and buy a chicken, which means you get eggs as well. Maybe you can save enough money for sandals so that you don't have to walk barefoot anymore. Maybe you get a few more buckets. So rather than going hours every single day, it only takes you 30 minutes to fetch your water for the day. And maybe instead of, you know, gathering wood every day to have an indoor fire, you know, and get smoke inhalation, you can buy a gas stove and your children can go to school instead of spending all day getting water and gathering wood. Now, for level three, it's those people earning between 8 and $32 a day. And there's actually 2 billion people living like this and it's a huge improvement on what the other levels were because now you don't have to fetch water. You can actually go out there and buy a tap to get some cold running water. Two of your children are starting high school. So once they finish, they might actually get better jobs than what you or anyone in your family have ever had. And then they might be able to move up to level four. And so level four is the absolute top level, which is 1 billion people in the world. And that's more than $32 that's us. per day. And so, uh, yeah, I'd say everybody listening to this, if you're able to uh, be able to listen to a podcast or buy a book, you're probably on the, the level four, $32 or more a day. He says that that's rich in the grand scheme of the world. You know, and you, to you, an extra $3 really doesn't make a difference. You've got 12 years of education. You can go and buy a car. You can have hot, you can have hot showers. You can have cold running water. And your income is now at a point where really the struggles of the other three levels, you can't even compute. You don't even understand these because you don't even live anything like that. So in really mitigating the risk of having this huge cognitive bias of the gap instinct, right? As we said, we just think us versus them, but the distinctions between the other levels are massive, right? It's the difference between your daughter dying, the difference between walking six hours to get water to actually just getting it from a tap. So they're absolutely massive. Yeah, if you think if you're up on if you're the top on level four in one of the one billion people, you look down at the other six billion people and it just looks all the same. It looks like everybody's in the you know in the them category, in the poor category, in the poverty. But there's an enormous difference between extreme poverty and relative poverty. So if you're you use the analogy, if you're standing on the top of a building and you look down, there doesn't appear to be a big difference between all the other buildings. Some of the buildings just look smaller. But if you're on the one of the, the smaller buildings, you can really tell there's a massive mm. difference between all the different uh, high rises just surrounding you. So I remember going into Indonesia last year and there's people just sitting there in Bali working in their shops and a lot of Australian tourists when they go there think, oh, they're so poor, uh, I really need to help them. But in, real, in reality, they're probably on level two or level three mm. and us Australians, we don't understand there's a massive difference between level one 
and level two and level three like like the people were in Bali. Like in, re, in reality, they're doing pretty good, man. They're, they're kind of developed. They've got everything they need, whereas probably our resources should be going to level one. So if we could understand the distinctions between level one, level two, and level three, we'd be able to understand where our resources might be better off going. Yeah, that, you said it's like a game that there's, you know, there's four different levels. Obviously, everyone's trying to move up a level, but and the most important jump is the the jump from level one to level two. That's an enormous, enormous improvement. But he says that level one is also by far the hardest level to to improve from. So that's the first mega misconception. He says that the world is divided into two. The second big misconception is that we believe the world is just getting worse. Yeah, we've got this uh, negativity bias or he calls a negativity instinct where we tend to notice all of the bad things around us and we think that everything feels like everything's just getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, crime is on the way up, violence, terrorism, they're all increasing. The climate's getting worse off. Economically, we're in trouble. It feels like everything is getting worse, but Han says that this is a big, a mega misconception. It's really hard to know about the good things. Like there's billions of improvements that are happening in small increments that are never actually reported. And they're not just these trivial little improvements, but actually absolutely world-changing, but way too small or slow to actually qualify it in the actual daily news. So if you take the trends of extreme poverty, for example, in 1800, it was massive to what it is today. It's really heading towards zero. Or even say 20 years ago, the rate of extreme poverty was 29%. Today, it's 9%. So, if you think about that level one who we were speaking about earlier, right, that's a drop of almost three times, which is massive. Which, And again, this never actually makes the news. Yeah, definitely. He says that, you know, another thing is like life in, life expectancy was 31 years on the you know, global average in 1800. That's and now ridiculous. It's, now, it's 72. So, that's a big improvement in 200 years. Uh, and he even says that, you know, if you think relatively, even about yourself, Hans was born in Sweden in 1948. He says uh, economically, in terms of the two countries, Egypt today is actually a lot wealthier a country than Sweden in 1948. And he even goes back to Hans's grandmother who was born in Sweden in 1891. And he says that's effectively the equivalent of Lesotho today. So it's saying that there's all these massive improvements, but we really don't see them because we're just focused on the negatives and these slow, gradual, positive changes over time aren't the things that we're talking about. So other small, gradual changes that are really don't get brought up, your things like oil spills are on the way down, the price of solar, HIV, deaths in battle, leaded gasoline, plane crash deaths, nuclear arms, hunger, ozone depletion, many more. There's a whole bunch of shit that is going way down. We're not even realizing it. Yeah, there's also a whole bunch of positive things that are all on the way up, like women's rights, harvest, um, science research, literacy, democracy, child cancer survival, electricity, water, internet, mobile phones. All of these things are all on the way up, but they're probably the things that we don't think about when we think of the extreme negative things that are going on at the same time. So, in this case, what Han says, factfulness is, like the, the more accurate way to look at the world is, you got to understand that that better and bad can coexist about the, the one topic. Yeah, if you look back and think this is bad, you also need to realize that whilst it is bad, it's also a lot better than it used to be. So, you, you need to realize that those two things can happen at the same time. It can be bad, but it can also be a lot better than it used to be. So, we're trending mm. in the right direction. Even though it's still not good yet, it's on the, it's on the way. If you think of poverty, right? If someone sold you nine percent of the world is in that extreme poverty and dying and there might be a number of 10 million that's bad that's bad and straight away you might have this negativity instinct and think the whole world's cooked but it's actually getting better so Mm. you can look at it from the view at both at the same time another one is that good news is not news and gradual improvement is not news so we know that what we're watching on tv they're not reporting on the tiny increments we're making every year that are compounding and we're also not uh, reporting on the really good things either also more news does not equal more suffering so, just because there's more bad news, sometimes just because there's better surveillance of all some of the bad things rather than actually uh, really capturing a trend of a worsening world. 
Yeah, if the news used to be at, at 6 p.m. every night for half an hour, whereas now the Six news channels. on Twitter is just, you know, every single minute, it might feel like there's so much more bad things going on in the world. But really, it's just that because we can access it more, that doesn't actually mean that there's more suffering in the world. So, that's it, what he calls mega misconception number two is that the world is getting worse. Now, mega misconception number three is that the world population is just increasing and increasing. So, nowadays, sustainability is a big title of almost every conference in the world and it's a big issue when it comes to the, the topic of sustainability. I mean, even me personally, about four years ago, I was of the thought if you're personally going to have a net, net positive impact in the world, then you probably shouldn't be having kids because... Uh, contributing to overpopulation in the planet is one of the worst things you can do. But thanks to hands, I kind of upgraded my worldview a bit and there might be a few little jointies popping oh, nice. out. <laughs> Not anytime soon. <laughs> well, what he says is that, you know, 10,000 years ago, there was like 5 million people on the planet and it took almost 10,000 years, like 9,800 9, years to go from 5 million to 1 billion. So, it took a long, long time to get to 1 billion. Then it only took 130 years to get from 1 billion to 2 billion. And then in the last 100 years, we've gone from 2 billion to 7 billion. Mm. So, you might think, holy crap, it took us, you know, it took us 10,000 years to get to a billion and then 130 years to get to 2 billion and then 100 years to get to 7 billion. Holy crap, exponentially, the world is going to have 50, 50 billion people very soon and we're going to all die. Mm, yeah, if you plotted that on a graph, it's just that classic exponential mm. hockey stick shaped graph. And you might just think, you know, the world population is just increasing. But what Anna says is the word just implies that if nothing is done, it'll just keep on going and going forever. Like she uses an analogy that, you know, her uh, daughter, you know, when she was six months old, she was 19.5 inches. And then after another six months, she grew 26 inches. And if you plot that on a graph, uh, the, she's going to grow to six foot tall by her third birthday. That if you take these two points and extrapolate them, it's going to keep growing and keep growing and keep growing. But uh, what she's saying is that's really not the right way to look at the world just because that growth rates happened in the past doesn't necessarily mean that the same growth rate is going to continue into the future. So, we really need to look at why has the population increased as rapidly as it has over the last 200 years and is that likely to keep going or is something else going to happen? So, the world's population does follow the trend like the granddaughter. She doesn't get to six foot in three years. She actually gets to the point where she matures and then plateaus and then doesn't grow any further. And this is what what, what Hans says is the case with the world population and it is the case with a lot of things. Like if we got this straight line in sync, we just think things will keep going in the same general trend forever when things just don't really follow that, that same trajectory. I mean, I remember when we started the podcast, we saw our downloads were growing at 25% per month and we were projecting in our brain that we're going to be oh, 25, 30% per month. We're going to be hitting, you know, uh, 1 billion downloads <laughs> in, in four years' time. And we generally believe that. And there's probably a lot of startups out there who put pump in a few assumptions when they're trying to get a few investors, you know, 15%. And then all of a sudden, there's always this hockey stick shape graph. But in reality, things don't follow that trend hardly ever. Mm. No, it's almost, it's almost impossible to think that any massive growth is going to continue and continue and continue. There's, there's something that's, uh, that's got to give at some point. And in the case of population, uh, the birth rate and the number of babies per women has been dropping dramatically since 1965. And it's down to 2.5 today. And if you think, you know, there's a mum and a dad, they have 2.5 kids, they're just replacing themselves and growing a little bit is a lot different to what it used to be over the last 200 years. So, as billions of people leave extreme poverty, what kind of happens? They all of a sudden don't really need to have large families for, for, for use of child labor and have a huge birth rate as insurance against a huge child mortality mm. rate that they, they would have had in the past. So, what, what tends to happen? So, women and men who get more educated, they actually start to want better educated and better fed less children. Yeah, and so if you think about it, say in 1800, the average woman had six births per child. And as we said, like level one, you know, you need to have a whole bunch of kids to go out and fetch the water and plow the fields. And on average, four out of those six children are going to die. So really only two are surviving. And now after, you know, from the 1800s through the middle of the 1900s, because of all these things around the world are improving, it turned out that, okay, maybe out of every six children you have, there's one death. And so, that's why this extra three kids who are living into adulthood, that's how the population was skyrocketing. 
And so now people are starting to realize as they move from level one through level two through level three, they don't need to have six kids anymore. And so as the average number of babies per woman is dropping down to 2.5, the, pop, the rate of population growth will mm. significantly taper off. Yeah, so it's this very simple equation. So ages ago, six kids, four dead, balanced, mm. skyrocketing hockey stick, six kids, one dead, mm. out of balance. And in the future, because we're getting more educated and a, and a better lifestyle, two kids, none dead, mm, exactly. balanced again. So we're, gonna, we're heading to the direction of actually balance. So we're actually just going to plateau at about 11 bill. So one thing that he says here is that we might think that you know oh we shouldn't be saving the the uh poverty stricken children because it's just going to keep our population growing and growing exponentially and the, the world can't handle it so some people might say that you know by saving all these poor we've got so many children if they got you know six children per women their population is going to keep growing exponentially the world can't handle it but really we're just delaying their escape from extreme poverty if we can move people from level one up to level two, up to level three, they're going to have less and less babies. So we don't have to worry about the same extreme risks of overpopulation. So I think it's a very popular dark worldview that a lot of people think but don't say. And that's the idea that they think that saving poor people just increases the population and is going to cook the world. But in reality, it's the opposite that's true. We actually want to save, not only save poor people, we want to actually improve their level of in, improve their lifestyle and get them up to level two, three, and four to the point where they're educated and they're in the new balance of two kids with none dead. That's a that's a pretty big banger. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty important. It's a very, uh, you know, as you say, different view to what some people might, might be thinking out there. So the next misconception is all about the size instinct. So looking at one statistic in isolation really doesn't give you enough information about what's really going on in the world. You really need to compare it to either other things that are happening in conjunction or other things that have happened in the past. And one good story here he uses to illustrate this, we go back to October 17, 2004. A lady named uh, Mari Larson, she's 38 years old, she's got three kids, and in the middle of the night, she's killed by multiple axe blows to the head. And so it was actually her former partner who broke into her house at night and killed her with, with an axe. So it was brutal. It's a tragic murder of a mother of three children. And it was barely reported in the news because on the exact same day, there's a 40-year-old father of three, also in Sweden. He's out hunting and he gets killed by a bear. And so that's pretty, also very brutal, also very tragic. And it's reported all over the news for a week. And so people are probably thinking, man, bear, bears are attacking. Bears are such a, a violent and, uh, and dangerous part of our world, of, of our life in Sweden. But if you actually look at the numbers, the last bear attack in Sweden was 1902. So in 102 years, one person was killed by a bear. But if you look at the numbers of domestic violence... In Sweden, every 30 days, a woman is killed by her partner or former partner. So there's a 1,300 times difference there in the size. But because we see on the news, one guy got killed by a bear, we, the numbers are way out of whack in our, in our minds. Mm, it's kind of like the availability cascade by Daniel Kahneman where because it's in the news and it occupies a part of our brain, we actually assign it more importance mm. in the world. And just a quick one, a little bit closer to the home. A few years ago, we had... Uh, in Australia, we had a few shark attacks. Same thing, man. Shark attacks occupied a huge part of political debate. Should we kill sharks? Should shouldn't we? Just because maybe one or you know the, the deaths is probably less than ten per year. In a world that doesn't have infinite resources, which they never are, we don't have infinite resources. The most compassionate thing you can do with your brain is actually to work out what's best by the statistics rather than the sensational one person. So, you know, for Australia, we might have dedicated a lot of resources to putting in nets to stop sharks and all this kind of stuff. But if we didn't fall for this size instinct, we know, all right, we're better off actually um, putting these resources into mm. violence against women. So, one of the tools he says is comparing the numbers. So, he says that last year, 4.2 million babies died. That's a huge number uh, and it sounds enormous. But if you actually think of it, the year before was 4.3 million. The year before that was 4.4 million. If you go back... 60 years, in 1950, was 14.4 million. So, yes, 4.2 million babies dying is a tragedy. It's an enormous number. But if you think 60 years ago was 14.4 million, that's an enormous improvement. So, another tool to overcome this is all about the 80-20 rule. 
So sometimes we naturally just assume that all numbers are equally important when we should actually do the 80-20 analysis to really think that some numbers are more important than others when putting it all together. And tool number three is to divide the numbers. So making it into you know a percentage or a comparison. So using that um, example of 4.2 million babies died, there was actually 141 million babies that were born that year. So it was a you know a mortality rate of three percent. So obviously, while that's a lot, it's not it's not enormous. And other mm. things like looking at per capita. Yeah, yeah. Like for that example there, if, if you just said to someone or in the news story, you could easily say four time 4.2 ma- million babies mm. dead. And straight away, you think, fuck. Yeah, the world's cooked. Good. But divided by the numbers and the infant mortality rate and understand the general direction, it's the opposite effect. You actually, oh, it's actually pretty good. We're getting better. So another area where we're actually better off dividing the numbers is on topics like climate change because it's really horrible that it is a common view in Australia, I'm sure in the US and other so-called developing con- developed countries that we actually blame the emissions on China and India, these developing countries, you know, getting electricity to these level one type people. Because as a whole, China and their whole economy per country is bigger than the world. But when you actually divide it per person, they're actually contributing hardly anything. And all of a sudden, the biggest contributors in the world are people from countries like Australia, uh, England, and the USA. So we should be looking at it per person rather than per country and an and easy way to um, shift the blame on other countries. Yeah, if you, if you just say China emits more CO2 than the USA or India emits more CO2 than Germany. It's co- yeah, it's so common though, isn't it? It is. But if you divide by the population on a per capita basis, it's really different. And the same goes for anything. Like, you know, the it's like saying, you know, oh, the, the body weight in China is higher than the body weight in the yeah. USA. But that's because they've got a shitload more people. If you go on a per capita basis, same goes for GDP, same goes for internet use, same goes for you know CO2 emissions, all of these things. It's more important to look at the, the per capita than just the absolute countrywide figure. So that's controlling the, the size instinct. Now, the next thing where we can be a little bit irrational in our view of the world is when it comes down to the urgency instinct. So it's common in all marketing, news stories, everything. It's like now or never, tomorrow's never be too late. You know, you've reached this final point. If you don't do it now, then mm. uh, you, you're gonna, never going to have this opportunity again. But it's it's almost never true and that's never the case. Yeah, he says that we, we need to relax a little bit. We, ne- we need to not fall for that trap. It's, a, it's an obvious trap and it's a, an easy one to fall into if we think there's some kind of impending doom or an opportunity we're going to miss out on if, we're, if we act too slow. We really need to, he says, just, you know, take a little bit of a breath. It's probably not as urgent as you think, but obviously things are important and you need to attack it in the right way rather than just jumping to conclusions and taking the first thing that comes to mind because otherwise you run out of time. You really need to slow down, think about it properly and do the right thing, not just the expedient thing. Because when it comes to urgency, a lot of the time we're kind of exaggerating the way things really are and exaggeration undermines credibility of well-found data. So, for, for example, uh, Al Gore with his with his documentary An Inconvenient Truth, on one hand at the time was really good to just wake up the world and say, mm. oh, this is a real problem. But, you know, 10 to 15 years on, he, some of his claims in that documentary are one of the biggest weapons of the people who are conservative saying, oh, yeah, Al Gore said this, but we're not underwater yet. So, it's this idea of exaggeration is really counterproductive to what your goals really are. Yeah, the, you can almost fall for a bit of the boy who cried wolf um, syndrome where you know the the skeptics can say oh well you said that before you've said that it was going to happen instantly and it didn't happen so how can we take you seriously so you really got to be careful with using the urgency instinct like it is a good weapon to use to get people to act but at the same time if you overdo it and it doesn't come to fruition then you're you're really shooting yourself in the foot so around the world like a lot of the time we do have this huge over dramatic worldview which is completely inaccurate or an inaccurate understanding of actually what's really happening in the world. But at the same time, Anna, she does really point out some of the things that we should be looking at and really devoting our attention and our resources to solving because they actually pose real risks to uh, big issues in the world. So, the five big risks that we should worry about that the, the three authors finish us off with is that, you know, one big risk is a global pandemic. So, you know, say for example, the Spanish flu swept across the world and killed 50 million people, which is more than any war has ever killed. So, some kind of global pandemic that spreads across the world is or could be a big concern that we should worry about. The second one is all about financial collapse. So, in a globalized world, 
the effects of financial bubbles are absolutely devastating. If you look at what happened in 2008, there was real pain on people. You know, it can crash entire economies of countries and put a shitload of people out of work and, you know, disgruntled citizens look for almost civil war and civil unrest yeah. to, to, to just rip everything apart. The third thing that we should worry about, he says, is World War Three. And I'd sort of never considered this, but things like the Olympic Games are actually somewhat vital to avoiding World War Three. Some kind of, whilst there is competition, it's also a worldwide collaboration between the countries to put in an event like this. But other things like international trade, educational exchange programs, free internet, anything that allows us to cross international and ethnic boundaries, he says, are, are really vital to maintaining the safety net of world peace. The fourth one is climate change. So to tackle climate change, we need a global solidarity to the needs of people on all the different levels of income. So we cannot deny the 1 billion people on level one who are working six hours a day to get water. We need to get them over the line and get them electricity. And it's really those in the developed countries like Australia, uh, like the USA, Canada, UK, all these kind of countries who emit the most, who are going to have the biggest influence when it comes to climate change. And the fifth global risk that we really do need to be conscious of is extreme poverty. So there are still 1 billion people on level one and they feel the impacts the most. So when we're solving poverty, there's no real innovation, more innovation or new thought paradigms really to solve it. It's actually just walking that last mile we've walked everywhere else. So it's pretty exciting. The next generation is going to be a, a, a runner in a very long relay race where each person who's or generations past the bats on to the next one has made the world better. And then the next generation, poverty might have actually ended. So that was factfulness. It's really an antidote to the really overdramatic and inaccurate worldview and some of the, the biases that we might have toward negativity. Uh, the world is genuinely getting better in general, but there are some risks that we should actually devote resources to in the right way and in the most effective way to, to actually make the world that little bit better. 